We have been pondering on this slide for some time, and the idea is to use automated tools to refactor your code on a case-by-case -case basis. So if these properties hold, do the refactoring. If they don't hold, uh, do some other refactoring if you know about them. So let's go back to the example from yesterday on coordinate-free numerics. So we want to solve the problem at the physics level. And we have these tensor types, vectors, covectors, dyadics of various forms and more. And we sort of come up with this language for talking about high performance solvers of PDEs, but you're talking at the language of the PDE itself and not at the language of arrays and data layouts. Well, the next step here is sort of integrated domain knowledge, like this property here called the Leibniz rules, which says that if how differentiation, the D operation, acts with respect to ring operation summation, then it distributes like that. And for the ring operation multiplication, it distributes according to this rule. So there are sort of various axioms that will hold for these tensors and you can then use that as optimization rules where appropriate. So aim for writing your code as clearly as possible and then have automated tools come in and do the transformations. And we sort of done this for seismic simulations and we hope to do this for offshore wind farms, sort of start from the high level equations and then build the packages that's needed to get this to work on a layered basis. Uh, so just to recapitulate an example from yesterday, there's the Berger's governing equation and then with some massaging for time integration, you sort of get this half step function and Put them together and get the full time step of the various equation. And then we're using these high level operators on uh, the tensor level, tensor abstraction level, which is coupled to the physics abstraction level. So these things have physical meaning and they're not just large multi dimensional arrays of the data. Now, to make this code runnable, we need to start with, uh, well, the tensor DSL, which we showed, showed sketch yesterday, and then we implement the TBD solver on the tensor DSL. So now I'm thinking type safe, generics, ARCA, Fortran style. So the tensor DSL has tensor fields, co-vectors, vectors, and operations are contractions, spatial derivatives, and stuff, which is the vocabulary you need to talk about the PDE and the solver, solver for the PDE. Now, the tensors are implemented, so implementing the tensor DSL is done in a continuous DSL where I think about, I have my data components, they are continuous structures over these data fields are working with. And now I have sort of do different implementations here, depending on what coordinate system I want to deal with. I have a Cartesian implementation, cylindrical coordinate system implementation, can exploit certain symmetries. I have implementation space and curvilinear coordinates, and I can sort of come up with a sort of wide range of using a continuous DSL to implement the TS tensor to the DSL and embed the co coordinate system we're working with at this way. So don't touch this code, but just create a library of various coordinate systems, which I can match up here because these operations are used to implement the tensor DSL. And typical operations here are Ring operations, which now applies to these continuous ring fields, and they're partial derivatives on these continuous structures. 
Then we move down to the spatial visualization level. And then we implement a continuous DSL by choosing spatial visualization. So we could do that in a multidimensional array language. Uh, so this has sort of ring operations of the multi array. So basically, you have an array data structure, you can drive plus, point plus multiplication, zero, one, subtraction, two. A multidimensional array structure in Fortran, and you can easily do this. The ring operations, and then uh, the partial derivatives translate into stencil computations on the array representation. The next level down is thinking about the hardware, and we want to provide an implementation of this array level based on hardware characteristics. So, depending on which hardware we want to target, we can write the implementation of the array, taking into account cache sizes, using distributed memory addressing to distribute our data across cores and CPUs. And we can sort of write the algorithms for multi core, use communication, or put them on a GPU for that matter. You sort of your choice when you implement the array. So this gives a sort of giving more precise control than you would have sort of just using the photon array. We assume that all of this is taken care of by the compiler, which does it to some extent, but doesn't really know how to, should know how to do cache sensitivity, but it would have to split the views and some transformations which most compilers don't do. But if you implement the multi-area DSL yourself, it's very easy to say, I put it all on the GPU and I keep my data running on the GPU until I'm finished. If the GPU, of course, is large enough. If your problem is very large, you will have to worry about multiple GPUs, communication between them and other stuff. But again, all those computations are now at this layer. It doesn't impact this, or this, or this layer. It's separated out, the different concerns are spread out in different abstractions, different Sort of, I've defined my requirements and I'm implementing the requirements of the layer above. And just stick everything together and voila, you have a running program on the GPU or distributed on a large machine. And this worked. We did the seismic code this way. We changed our equation on the top from elastic to poroelastic. And we could solve sort of the poroelastic wave equation on real seismic data. So now we come to the big exercise. You have a domain you're working with. Try to use these techniques to come up with an IDSL for your domain, or in other words, the requirements you would use for a photon template. Find the types you have in that domain. And note they are not often manifested the way we speak about the domain, it's how we think about the domain. The operations, again, not how we speak about the domain, but how we think about it. We think about names, but we speak about strings. We think about PDEs, but we speak about arrays. Try to sort of get to what you think about in the domain and not what you speak about. It's much easier if you can speak and think about the same things, but in these sciences, we have often created separate languages for how we express ourselves, especially towards the computer and how we think in the domain. And some of this is how hardware was organized when we invented programming languages. So in the old days, like the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, the programming language had to reflect the computer to make the program run efficiently. So then after that, we're stuck with expressing our ideas as array code and not as tensor level code, not as coordinate free code. 
So we're writing everything. Uh, this layer in the multi-array DSL and not at that layer. And then make everything explicit while you work on your problem. So you don't have hidden information and just do a fragment of your domain, but make all the information explicit. And also note that often the same terminology is used for different things in different parts of a domain. So don't get confused about things being called the same. Okay, how long should we use for this exercise? Half an hour? Because if we're going to do anything real out of it, we need some time for this. What is the time now? It's time. It's time also. Shall we sort of do this till 10.40? And I will mingle with you and sort of give you some advice as you work on this. But who's going to work with who? Then we would have to have a... And this is why remote is very difficult. I can just leave the system on and we have this. People can speak if they want to, so then we can catch if there's anything going on. Okay, uh, until 10.40. Go. Oh. So you see the nice screen, I see lots of trouble. Okay. Um, so now we did this exercise and we are shifting gear because we are going into the mathematics of arrays. Now what we did so far is that we talked about how to associate rules, properties with an API. And the mathematics of arrays is basically lots of properties around arrays and then how to use those to optimize code. So it was de developed by Lenore Merlin in her PhD thesis back in 1990. And she was heavily inspired by APL. Uh, that's an uh, old experimental programming language. So it's an array processing language, or it's just a programming language, depending on your viewpoint. Uh, they had lots of money probably because they invented a special keyboard to type mathematical symbols. It's very compact, it's expression oriented, and you can use lots of strange symbols. You can actually find implementations of it now where you can use normal keyboards to type the name of the symbols and then sort of convert it into the appropriate symbols. But without extensive training, uh, using APL is difficult because it's so compact in the notation. But they do very nice map functions and things like that. It's very compact. Notation is very mathematically inspired, so that's why they use Greek letters and strange symbols to express the computations. So in Lenore's work, she's continuing that and coming up with the Greek letters as at times by the operation at another time the same letter is a unit operator and it really need to look into the context to figure out how to parse these statements. Uh, other people have sort of more or less independently rediscovered lots of that stuff and we did also have sort of quite a large set of matrix algebra, array algebra, in the way we were developing the previous system. But when I was sort of introduced to Lenore at an array conference, she was sort of basically commenting every presenter at that conference that, why don't you reference mathematics of arrays? Because what you're doing is just a small subset of, of this whole thing. So it was sort of, the tenet is that multi-arrays are a formal structure with an algebra. And for us, uh, this would be a template requirement for an IDSL, so we can sort of 
fit that easily into this template programming framework. And then these mathematical array operations, which then are called the Psi calculus. We can see that as a properties, the equations that we can use from our IDSL to modify uh, the template body code to optimize it with respect to array expressions. Now, the optimization here has two phases. And this is sort of what I found very necessary in my work with the array algebra, because I didn't spot this. And that is the first step is V writes of a code where it sort of globally looks through the program and extracts what is happening at this array element. How is this modified? And you get a large expression for the array element. That's very good these days because that large expression means that you have lots of compute for updating an array element. And most of the time, that will just have a limited need for access to data in the neighborhood of the element. So that gives you a dense compute per area element, which then you can sort of run in parallel. Uh, also, the, this is a denotational normal form, which means that however your source is organized, you end up with the same format for this. And these transformations are precise. You can always run them. They will always terminate and you always get the same result. And then there's a second stage where you take this DNF form and you translate that into operation forms, which are supposed to match the target hardware. So then you are sort of optimizing your code with respect to cache sizes, the number of cores, the communication structure, the array layout, so that you can run your dependencies efficiently on the computer. Now, Lenore has been optimistic because she was thinking that if you have enough characterizations of the hardware, there was a normal form for it, optimal form for that hardware. I'm less optimistic. I'm sort of thinking that, okay, at least you have a language where you can try the different layouts, you can try different transformations and see what the effect is. But we cannot fully automate the process of trying to optimally map your computation to the specific hardware. At least when the hardware is doing so many things automated internally in the process, so you don't think enough data to understand what's going on. Well, there's some interesting new processors coming up, motivated by machine learning applications, which are more data flow oriented, perspective on the programming, and they have more deterministic behavior. So maybe it's possible to sort of map computation to those processes in a very controlled way. Uh, I think that this mathematics of array algebra, the right rules, optimization stages are going to be more important for photon uh, because the right type can wrap an array. So we get indirect next to null arrays already, which sort of challenges photons very simple model of arrays and structure of arrays is the good way of writing code because once you have the right type, an object with an array inside of it to indirectly have an array of arrays. And then we have generic instantiations. When you instantiate like the template, you want to instantiate that with. When you instantiate something with an array structure, and then at the next level, you want to have the elements of that array structure be another array, like in a block matrix example. The inner array is the inner block is a 2D matrix, the outer block is a 2D matrix, and photon doesn't like that. So you need to wrap the inner matrix to be able to put it inside the outer matrix. But if we could have an array algebra, we could sort of deal with this and end up with the structural arrays notation with multidimensional arrays at the end. So because of these sort of 
changes in the photon language, unless people start using these things, we're going to see that nested arrays appear indirectly in photon and there's a need to handle that. Uh, so what is the Moore algebra? And some of it was already in, is already in the photon. Actually, the norm was on the photon committee sometime in the 90s. So some of the ideas are there. Uh, so one of the things that you can see in photon is you can do a reshape of an array. And that's in some sense is something that comes from mathematics arrays. On the other hand, it, some sort of reshape was possible already in Photon 77 because an area had a certain layout and then you could do certain tricks with that to interpret it as a linear layout. Uh, what the idea is in Moa is that every array has a shape and in the compiler, that's sort of often called the delta vector, it describes sort of how the extent is for every one of the axes. When you declare an array, you are declaring it with a shape. And I think shape is now becoming a separate data structure in Fortran. That is, it's a linear array, but you can now use this array in some operations as some, some parameters to actually talk about which layout I want the array to have. Uh, and the other thing is that an array has a layout, which actually says if I'm using an index ijk, where in memory is that index going? Now, we talk about the layout of arrays in memory, and we say that uh, Fortran uses column first, C uses row first. But you can just think that well, maybe the layout is one thing and the index is another thing, and then we can sort of remap the indices so that they fit a problem domain better and then we remap how they are interpreted in memory so that we get an efficient computation of them. Now, so some of the operations in the array algebra is reshaped, so you don't move the elements, just tell them this is not the four by three array anymore, it's a three by four array, or two by two by three array, or two by three by two array, or some other variation. Don't move the elements, you're just saying I'm changing my indexing pattern. Uh, if you have an array with three dimensions, and it does use two of them, then you return the set array, which is a one dimensional array. If you have three indices and just have use one of them, you get the 2D array back. And I also think that the array algebra for Trump does something like this. So, well, this is sort of very nice. You can sort of index more or less precisely and get hold of the subarrays that are in, in there. So, uh, incomplete index is a subarray, a complete index is an element. You can transpose an array, which then swaps to the index to the axis, and this moves data normally. You can rotate the elements on, along one of the axes, again, moving the data. But in the DNF form, you're replacing data movements by index instead of cells so instead of moving the data you are sort of pointing to changing your index and pointing to where the data was supposed to be before you rotate. And we have point wise ring operations and this actually gives you a transformation system that you can use this is sufficient for five different methods to systematically transform your array the computation into the DNA. Um, this part, if you take away transpose, this part will be this nicely terminating rewrite system. Now that's a thing to worry about because rewrite systems are not necessarily terminating. You might get into infinite loops and there's a whole bunch of theory about rewriting systems, which is rather complex to get into. Now, as I started out with the DNF, can 
Apart from any higher codes, we can be loop based, so we have multiple loops following one another, or it can be this high level corner free rotation. As long as there's an array algebra hidden on the near, it be an extra. So that's a matter of tooling whether you can sort of take the old 477 codes and uh, do the DNF transformation on that. Uh, as I mentioned, it's always terminating the same DNF form, so it is canonical in the computations. And as I said, we proved this for stencil computations. We haven't proved this if you use outer products, inner products, um, other kinds of primitive operations. DNF is dense per every element, so it's really what you want when you want to sort of decompose your computations and map them on hardware. You know everything you want to do with every array element in your computation. And the DNF part is fully automatable. You just start the process, sit back and watch it terminate, probably in a few seconds. But if it's a very large program, it will take more time. But again, these tools are not there, but I think they are fair, fairly easy-ish to write so that we can start using them on large scale of code. And uh, people are seeing this will be needed. So there will probably be a study group on mathematics or array in the Fortran context. The operation forms are more difficult to control. So they need some scripting engine to talk about how you want to perform these transformations. Well, that script then sort of tells you how your code is going to be manipulated to match, hopefully, some certain hardware. And then, of course, you can read up the script, modify it, and see if a different mapping to hardware changes the right frame properties. So this is the operation form, which is mapping to the hardware. So we have different operational forms for different hardware architectures. Um, to some extent, you may be able to have cost functions which will guide over three right points in the form. But I'm not certain that this is easily doable. Examples of operational form rewrites is introducing padding. So we duplicate subarrays for each core, and then you can compute locally and you have more compute and less communication. And more seldom communication, you still need to communicate the same amount of data, but you can block it. Big chunks and sending small amounts of data every iteration. So, this normally is a good trade off for today's architectures. And also, if you have circular boundary conditions, this would remove modulus computations, which for some strange reasons still seem to be expensive in hardware. Another transformation is called dimension lifting. It's when you repartition the array, reshape it to have it map better to hardware characteristics. So you may filter out the size of the cache and sort of make certain that you index the cache in one block and then you have five or array dimensions with cache. One dimension is indexing the caches and the other is the index within each cache. And those kind of reshape improves the efficiency because now your code is split into parts which run inside the cache and parts which mean do the cache miss and load the cache. So the way you're controlling your indexing now, the way you iterate in your arrays can be done very cache friendly. And that's a boost for most computers. And then you can transpose data, which means that you're moving data that you need closer together at the cost of moving other data further apart. For some computations, there's no benefit because you need 
data from all axes in other computations. This can be really beneficial. And combining this with sort of cache layout, you can actually move data which needs to be in the same cache closer together and therefore having things more efficient. So one of the effects here is you can um, block your array structures so that everything in the same block goes into the same cache, which normally is beneficial. And note, these are rules which you can apply to your code. You don't have to sit and rewrite every loop in your code. And also you're working on the DNF form, which means that all the computes have been collected before you start adapting your array shapes. So that's the plug for this. And that's basically what I was thinking of talking about now. But are we early for the final break or for lunch break? About the same yesterday yeah because we can continue with working on the assignment of investigating the domain but let me just sort of summarize so you sort of get my in your face so type safe templates is where we started yesterday uh, the template requirements are in internal DSL and uh, today we extend that with properties, assertions inside a procedure and the assertion has an equation in it and an equation can be used to rewrite. So we can take the template body which is written in terms of the requirement So this is type safe generics so you're forced to stick to the requirements inside the template body. But then it also means that if I have properties which I believe should hold of my instantiation, then I can use that to manipulate my body from a human friendly expression of the intention of computation to a more computer friendly expression of how the compute should go. There are specific transformations which are very device specific, and the general transformations like MUA, which works on array structures. And let us be talking about this layered structure. So some of it will be direct on arrays, some of it will be at the tensor level, some of it will be at continuous level, and you might have different rules in each of these levels which you then can exploit. We talked about domain engineering as a method to discover the idea itself. So of course, in the obvious cases, I want to have a collection and need a type. That's sort of very trivial. This is what you see in Java, you see this, it's, it's, you see this everywhere. But once we try to move into more domain-specific stuff, like trivial traveling examples, like complicated PVEs for various kinds of physics, then figuring out what's really going on is sort of a more involved task. And some guidelines, some hints about what to do is quite useful. And then we are sort of being able now to take our equations and apply them as systematic transformations. We did the AOS, which is normally seen as good software, to SOA, which will normally be more efficient software. And as a transformation, that's problem independent, but very often will be beneficial. And mathematics of arrays, which is also problem dependent, but uses the same technology as up here to reorganize your array codes to be more efficient. So, since we have some time before lunch, maybe we should use that to continue with the exercise, or maybe some body online has some insights or thoughts they would like to share. So it's about 11.30 now. You talk about array things that come in book. Yes. Do you have some uh, code that shows how it could be used? Uh, Is it with a reshape operation on that? How do you call a syntax of that? Look like. Well, that's already in Fortran, and I think it's called reshape. Okay. 
there's going to be an effort to systematically look at array level operations to do what the mathematics of array does. So it's going to be inspired by Leonard Melvin's thesis and later work. And we'll try to see how sort of what kind of rules are needed to do the array transformations you need today. Now that study group has not been instantiated yet. It probably will be headed by the NAG compiler developer. Uh, because he was very interested in that in the generic subgroup we've seen a real need for taking up an array algebra like that. So I have a feeling it's going to be studied very carefully and some suggestions will probably be made and we are still sort of in this five year window before 2028 so assuming everything goes smoothly this extension might come. But it's too early, sort of the study group hasn't been set down. There's no requirements papers, there's no design papers, there's the noise thesis. Some of our work is sort of plugging into that. Some of my students have written thesis related to the mathematics of arrays. You can pick up there. You can find recent work where the Nora has been involved and can pick up ideas. One of the Unfortunate things is that Lenoir's work was tied to APL, which makes parsing her thesis hard. So it takes more work to get into the ideas than necessary. So I think one of the early things is to recast that into more modern notation, more limited notation like we're using in Fortran, rather than having to rely on uh, the original more document. I get the question, but I mean, the standardization is a long process. And yes. You see some, some, for example, C++ 23 or new new stuff, but I can't use it yet. <laughs> I have to wait. It's yes. So and then, yeah. But the new stuff in 2023 C++, you probably can find it was discussed in 2018. Yeah. I've seen a lot of those things before, and then, then ah, now it's available, but it's, <laughs> it's a long process too. Yes, because you need to be certain that the ideas are matured, that they are well thought through, that compiler vendors actually can implement them, that they won't cause great runtime penalties, which is sort of a big scare in C++. And that's why it sort of is a multi-year process. Very few things can sort of come as an ID and be ready for the seven or three years. But what happens in C++ is that you have all these ideas sort of being investigated and matured, and everything that's matured by the cutoff date for 2023 will be in the standard. Everything that sort of has any doubt with it, which is felt as not fully there will sort of be postponed for 2026. And I think Photon is going into that mindset. So generics is sort of one of the first initiatives which has started before now the 2023 standard, and which is expected to continue for the following standard. Mathematics of array is probably slightly faster process. So starting that in 23 may also make it for the 28th standard. But Photon is much slower in evolving. In C++, there's about 200 people involved. In Photon, there's sort of 20 people. But it's also a great, I mean, every time you add something, there's also the risk of breaking things broken. Yes, which is one of the reasons things go slowly. You yeah. need to really be certain that you're not breaking unintentionally things. And there's a big discussion going on for the past week is zero initialization of numerical variables. The one camp says that it's a good idea, then everything is initialized and you know what's in memory. And the other camp says, well, it's undefined behavior now which means that the compilers can flag it for you. And that flagging really helps us to trace, track down bugs. 
And in many of our examples, the default value of zero will be irrelevant. It should default to something else, which may be a case by case specific value. So it's much more important to track uninitialized number of values than it is to have a default in the language. Yes? And I will see that uh, the GPUs are, are, are easy to stay and they will evolve and they will become slightly interesting in the future. So we might see that the compilers can adapt all the vector code directly into the machine learning. That's something very good for, for since there will be no penalty to go to external device memory, external memory will probably, and the others will probably have shared memory. So there will, be, penalty will not be there. And then vector syntax might be directly mapped to the GPUs. Yes, that's a good point. And it also is so that you need mathematics or arrays either explicitly talk about it or build it into the compiler because you need to remap the array so it will fit inside the GPU, fit inside the caches, fit inside the shared memory, you need to know when you need to move data back and forth. And that kind of analysis is basically what MOA is about. So that's why sort of MOA, whether explicitly in the surface syntax or as a general tool across compilers, Probably is going to happen. Yeah, why find this is learned is is very expressing the thing of the past, so they be totally integrated. So it's good that. Yeah, well, that's sort of very good because then you move things to the computational device that's most appropriate, or you can experiment with it, and that's why I think more can give the developer that control by having sort of lots of developer-oriented options controlling the layout. Because now you sort of succumb to the compiler or you put in lots of directives which guides the compiler in what to do, but there's no connection between the actual code and the directives. But if you sort of go MOA style, you're not putting the directives in the source code, you're putting them in the script saying, I want to do this transformation, I want to do this layout, I want to map this to that hardware. And then you can see in the script whether it's consistent with the hardware you want to run on now. So you would change script if you're moving from upgrading your machine from one hardware to another hardware. And then it would sort of be very clear, change the script. Don't look through all your source code to find which of the OpenACC directives needs to be changed. And did somebody modify the source code so this OpenACC directive is now out of place? We don't have tools to detect that. That's scary because sometimes an improper OpenACC or OpenMP directive gives code with the wrong semantics. It computes something different. And there's no one. More questions, any comments in the chat? Yeah, I, I'm not sure whether I must have to comment. You said something about initializing uh, data. Yeah. Um, on a, perhaps it's more market uh, some solutions to that. Right now, uh, that if you do shared memory type program, yeah. it's quite often, or in order to get performance, what current thinking is that quite often you declare a large data structure, but you could uninitialize. Mm. Because by the time you initialize it, you force it on one of the main managers. So, CC Numa. Um, so, um, so, um, if, so um, if I teach shared memory, in C, I, I put Carlock on the index. Mm -hmm. Both Carlock stuff, Malloc stuff. And then you have, uh, so typically it is, uh, hard, current hardware is set up that the stuff is located close, closest to the writing. Mm -hmm. So in initialization, you typically um, force or determine where in which memory bench it goes on. Mm -hmm. And that in, um, so it, in all, 
So how that is done currently, it's very important that when I malloc or allocate the data structure, nothing really happens mm -hmm. in the system. So if uh, now these people come in, we can't have uninitialized data mm -hmm. structures. It, uh, unless they give a solution for uh, programming a CC NUMA architecture in, uh, mm -hmm. for the uh, memory allocation issues in CC NUMA, this, this would be very, very difficult. Yes, uh, what's a bit fascinating is that if you're running single CPU, uh, very often when you allocate memory for security reasons, that memory is pristine, basically zero initialized. Because otherwise you can use your memory allocations to spy on random parts of memory which is very bad if you are in a multi-process setting and you are able to allocate a large array and siphon that off and then see what's in memory. This was a well-known security error in SSL, OpenSSL implementation a few years ago, almost 10 years ago now, I think this hard to, hard to believe the bug. You were able to send in information, allocate memory, raw memory, and get out the information that was there. Because OpenSSL was bypassing the compiler's normal use of serialization when allocating data. But the Unix systems typically, um, if I'm malloc, mm -hmm. most of, if I take it to GCC or into the compiler, the uh, malloc instructions that doesn't. So if I have 64 gigabyte server and ask for 200 gigabytes of an array, it just returns. It doesn't do anything. No. And in my understanding, that creeps out of Linux or Unix. So it's not so uh, It depends on how they organize the memory, because very often if you try to read the memory you've allocated, you will get zeros. Not because it has been initialized, but because when you start accessing it, you're getting a cache miss and it says, oh, this memory has not been allocated. I'll fill it with zeros and not copy it from memory. So you default getting zero initialization, even though you've never asked for it because that's the secure way and it doesn't cost you more, it costs yeah, you less. But then you're already doing read accesses. Uh yes, but your problem is now different. You're on this sort of shared memory computer. And the question is, how do you tell the runtime system where to allocate memory? Now, the problem there is basically that the C programming language has no way of talking about memory allocation, no way of talking about shared memory allocation or memory, where memory should be allocated for which processor. So you do that very indirectly by having a rule saying the processor that writes to memory is the owner of that segment of the array, which is sort of a pragmatic solution. But as you point out, it's not part of the standard. Maybe nobody working with the standard is thinking about this as an application that should survive an improvement of the programming language because this is such a weird ad hoc usage of a normal activity in the program to indicate where in memory some data is supposed to be stored. We really should have a language feature telling us where do we want to allocate this memory? On which processor, for which part of the core, on which GPU should this memory go? But we're not having that as a language feature. We're having it sort of indirectly in the way your code initializes. And it's very important for performance. You get more well, so yeah. yeah. So we need a way to doing it. And now we sort of, the compiler has invented a, what do you call it, sort of, a, pragmatic way of doing it. It's sort of a principle of linking up certain activities with other effects 
that are not part of the language itself. So I think this is sort of talking back to my remark the other day that our programming languages we are using today were developed for a 1970s, 1950s hardware architecture. And they embed so much of that experience into how you write code that you cannot talk about those things that are important today. And we come up with all these other schemes for indirectly talking about it because we cannot express it directly. Yeah, uh, okay. One other thing I was just thinking, I, I see what you say. I don't know how to uh, to solve that so, since mm. for instance, for time doesn't have an integrated part about shared memory. No. The closest is the co-array, which you probably can use in a certain way to do that. Yes, it's a problem. It's a problem. The other thing is quite often with um, so initialization, if you force everything to be initialized to zero, so you just uh, make initialization the mechanism. If I read it, it um, most likely it gets automatic. It gets automatically zeroed out. Mm -hmm. and, uh, then uh, it depends how I want the stuff initialized. So if I want, uh, if I allocate a data structure mm -hmm. and want it zeroed out by default, so the C type, mm -hmm. then uh, it depends how it's implemented. It, uh, there might be uh, essentially it might be a copy operation, mm -hmm. which is a very evil thing because if I do a large copy, it uh, validates invalidates a lot of cache which I might. Yes. Um, and uh, then uh, it depends uh, if I really want uh, to begin with this data structure zero, it might be a good idea performance wise if I ignore the cache coherent number if I just write a zero program. But if the initial value I want to have is non trivial, let's say I read in, uh, I have a matrix structure and I want to initialize that from file, mm -hmm. then I, I, I blow in all my caches for nothing because I initialize that to zero. Yes. And I, I have no interest in it being initialized. Yes. So, and uh, then uh, later on, I write something which initializes this to what I wanted to be initialized. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, okay, then I have a copy if I read it from file or if I random initialize it or whatever. Uh, but um, that is stuff which I need to do because that is what the program needs to do. Yep. So, it's, this is then valid work. So, in, in, this, in one way, I'm quite. Out of these two examples, I'm quite objecting to stuff being. Uh, I should be able to create uninitialized data structures. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, so if, for instance, a large, large array, I can uh, automatically reasonably initialize it to zero or one or perhaps some, something like that. Mm -hmm. But if it's, a, let's say, an array which comes from file, that, that, that will always be something. Read the file, yeah. put it in, read the next portion, put it in. And, uh, a slow process. So around the year 2000, we were sort of doing lots of stuff with C++. And the interesting thing is if I had an array of a user-defined type, that would use the default initializer on every element of the array. The compiler did this. But if it was of integer type, it didn't run the integer initializer, it just gave me the chunk of memory. And at that time, that chunk of memory had rubbish in it, yeah. or maybe it had somebody else's secrets. We didn't try to dump it and see what it was. It was annoying that it wasn't initialized because we wanted to know that every data item you were working with had well-defined value. And it's even worse because if your array is of pointers, those pointers may not be null pointers. They may point to random parts of memory, which is outside of the domain, and they get seg faults if you try to do anything with them. If you want to do a bug, you can do a bug. If you're dealing with, if you forget to initialize your data, then it's a bug. Yes, so we wanted to check, is it a null pointer? Then we do something to it. If it's a non-null pointer, we assumed it was active. So then we had to write explicit loops 
for every allocated array to make certain that all the pointers were null pointers. Well, for every other data type that was automatically calling the default constructor. So you had to make lots of sort of special default array constructors for the primitive data types, which was very annoying. So you said still that uh, stuff, uh, if I allocate stuff, uh, what are you speaking about? Automatic arrays or also malloc structures? Uh, when I declare static alloc array, so I say okay. int a200, for instance. That is what I call an automatic array. Yeah. Okay, an automatic yeah. array. Okay. If that was int, it would have random information in it. Now it generally has zeros in it because of memory safety. It's not has zeros in it because it actually is allocated. It has zeros in it when there's a cache miss and the compiler sees that this has not been used yet. So then it just fills the cache with zeros rather than filling memory with zeros. But yeah, that's an effect of the compiler. It's not in the standard. But you, before reading it, it is uh, getting uninitialized. It is not that the, that the, the process of handling and modifying the implementation. No, um, you can't tell the difference. The, I think it is pending the physical allocation of the data. And the moment you try to do anything to it, either read or write, it will fill the cache line. And then it says, oh, this data is pending. Therefore, it will just zero the cache line. And then you can work from there. I don't need a memory access to fill the cache line since this memory hasn't been allocated yet. Yeah, there are special instructions uh, on some hard yes, uh, that you can uh, save the load stream if you're just writing. Mm -hmm. The DCBZ is on a power. Yes. Uh, data cache line, data cache blocks. Um, yes, I let the compiler deal with that. Yeah, yeah, no. But yes, there are instructions that save some runtime. Yeah, no, it, it saves your full load stream. Yeah. You, you said that before that. Uh, the, the, OpenSSL had this bug that it allocated memory and didn't initialize it. No. Um, in the language standard, so the C ethos is that declaration is initialization. So in the declare variable, it gets initialized with a default initializer. Now the built-in data types in C++, int, long, float, double, pointers, they were invented before initializers were invented. So in some sense, they don't have default initializers. So therefore, that kind of memory is just left uninitialized. Now on certain modern machines, when you try to use that memory area, it will have to be loaded into cache, but the compiler has seen that it's not been initialized previously, so then it will just give you a zero cache instead of loading it from memory. So in which case you save the load stream? So you're not really looking at any of the bit patterns in memory, which this cache line maps to. You just ignore what's there. You establish a zero cache line. With cache line with zeros, is loading up. And uh, on, a, on a streams benchmark, that is something like a quarter of the performance. Mm -hmm. You have then two stream, three streams instead of four. Here was, um, it just pointed out that. Uh, <laughs> I thought it's two. Uh, there's number seven. Non initialized data is a bug type, indeed. Um, perhaps I. Uh, can you hear me? I'm not sure where I should look now. So uh, the comment was, uh, so in, in, I, I'm not uh, intending to do a read access to an uninitialized data structure. 
All what I want is that uh, if I malloc a data structure, it is not, uh, it's not really accessed. And then I would, uh, then obviously the first access to this data need to read access that it gets a meaningful value. I didn't, I was completely unaware of the security implement, implementation, which a magnet just pointed out to them. Um, but uh, so for instance, if you do shared memory uh, programming, that is really, uh, that is, as Magnet pointed out, it's, it's sort of like the back, through the back door. Mm. It's, but it is really, uh, it's very important that, uh, so you're really exploiting that uh, malloc is not, uh, is not doing anything. And that uh, by the time you initialize it, uh, the core which initializes that piece of memory puts it closest to itself, such that you uh, get very, yeah, good memory access inside the process. And uh, the other thing is that uh, it depends how an initialization is done. If the automatic initialization is nothing which I need, uh, then uh, then why why so then why putting the caches? I agree with you that if I read an uninitialized data structure, I get further Christmas value. So sometimes you see it when running in a debugger, and you. Uh, Look, what is the storage? What is the contents of this element? And it is just a random pattern. Mm -hmm. And uh, in a certain way, if I also don't quite see, so um, if um, if you initialize everything by default to zero, but you, you make it back, you forget that is not the original initialization you want. Yes. Then, then suddenly you calculate the zeros, but you wanted something else. It remains yes. stuck. And this is heated discussion on the C++ standards list. It's been going on for a week. And there's like several opinions per hour about exactly that. Exactly. <laughs> but then I find it almost patronizing. So right now there is malloc, there's calloc. If I wanted zero out, you use calloc. But if you want performance, you better don't use calloc. Yeah, but well, the problem is when you have objects, classes, and your class has some internal consistency. So it needs to establish that consistency before you can use it for anything, before you can even update the position that object. So then you want to have some default initialization, which actually does create consistency. Because if you use the assignment statement on inconsistent data, it's going to crash. And the assignment statement does not know whether this was previously initialized or whether this was uninitialized values. And if it just gets initialized to zero by default, does that happen? That might help because if you are looking sort of if this pointer is pointing at such and such a value and doing this, if it's a null pointer and doing something else, and you get unallocated memory and it's pointing somewhere, and you do something based on the fact that the pointer is pointing somewhere. So this is when you're not working with the primitive data types, but you're working with user-defined data types which have non-trivial consistency requirements, which is often the case. Okay. As I said, there was some, uh, when, when you allocate memory so using malloc mm -hmm. in the system, uh, does the operating system, I mean, you said there's security implications, yeah. that you can get the memory that was previously used. Yep. Uh, I think that, that, that's more of a system problem that you need to, Make sure the operating system doesn't give you memory that has other data in it or. Yes. That, so when I was working with machines 30 years ago, you just got uninitialized memory and probably there was other user data there, but we never cared that much no. because it thought it was a nuisance that I have these random values and I need to do something with that. But now these days, there are people who will actually poke into those random values and use them. Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> so. Now you're running. So when you get fresh memory, it's zero. 
but now your process is sort of redeclaring that memory because you're calling another subroutine. Should it then load the data from memory, which now has some unused rubbish values in the system, or should it just give you something fresh in the zero cache line without you fact actually loading that piece of memory, which is totally useless? And as I said, this has performance implications. Not loading useless data saves you. Expecting memory, just randomly allocating and looking at it, see if you can find something exciting, interesting. Mm, that's a different business. That's not trying to write correct high performance code, that's doing something else. But all these different perspectives sort of have to meet somewhere in the language standard in the tools that are being built. So, uh, oh. da, 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 da. so uh, in the document, there are now three entries by LV. Uh, uh, okay, Lars, can you just open your microphone and comment? I'm not reading that. <laughs> I, don't, I don't understand whether it's a three is one, the three is more. I think it's the easiest if you just start discussing that. Lars? Do you have a speaker? Uh, hello. <laughs> yeah. I guess you hear me now? Yeah. Yes, we heard you perfect. Yes, you're good. Uh, what was your question? Uh, okay. uh, entries 8, 9, 10 in the question comments document. So mm -hmm. I, uh, instead of me reading those and uh, try, first trying to understand that, I thought that perhaps the easiest is if you just uh, discuss your entries 8, 9, and 10 over the microphone. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So so you, you were talking about how you would get arbitrary contents for automatic variables you should be able to initialize them in both C and C++ if you want to ensure that you get zeros, even for primitive types. By, as in the common document, using an uh, equals uh, parenthesis zero to put values in them. And yes, but that forces allocation of memory and sort of a storage of the cache line. Yeah, it will always be on the same stack of memory. And I don't think that initialization would affect optimizations around whether something is emitted on the stack or not. Uh, can you hear me, Lars? Yes. Uh, so if I just take your example, so the example is int a of 200 equals zero. So yes. allocating in. So what you do is that there are these 200 elements, so this is a uh, four, byte, four byte integers on most architectures. Mm. So we are speaking of something like 800 bytes, almost a kilobyte. You yeah. just establish that on the L1 or L2 cache and zero it out there. So uh, mm. all the contents which was there, which you might uh, need again, with, so you flush the cache. So the contents which was in that cache level before you start initializing that structure is, uh, is, is pushed to a lower cache level into, or into memory. And that, so uh, essentially, um, so uh, data initializing of data structures that uh, sort of needs to be quite close to where you do it. And, uh, and in particular, this access, so you're flushing off something like a kilobyte into cache level. And uh, then, uh, then you better do that locally where you actually need to manipulate the data. Uh, I would argue that that's true when you have low optimization levels. A recent paper showed that the uh, these initializations can often be elided by the compiler and do not really matter. They just ensure that you get the right values if you read out of the memory at the point you're reading them. Uh, it depends a bit, it depends yeah. a bit. It's as was said, it's an active discussion on the C++ community of how 
what performance uh, trade-offs there are, and there seems to not be as bad as it used to be. But there's another problem here, mm -hmm. and that is if I have a template with a type T, and inside the template body I have a function which needs to allocate an array with 200 variables of type mm -hmm. T. Yeah. I don't know what the initializer for type T is, so I cannot write equal zero. I would have to yeah. call the default initializer explicitly. And on old code, that would not touch the integer values in the array, nor touch pointers if it was an array of pointers. Yeah. Because yeah. integers and pointers did not have a default initializer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, spelling the initializer correctly there is a problem. So it might have been changed, but we yeah. stopped trying those things some years ago. So I haven't tested them recently to see if that has improved. Yeah, there may be some trait these days that may help, but I'm not well versed in that either. No. Now, there are too many special cases in the language like C++, so whatever you do, you're going to hit one of them unexpectedly. Mm -hmm. This is also a problem when they evolve the language, because there are so many interactions between the new features and the old features that they're typically discovered two years later that it had some unexpected interaction. Mm -hmm. And then they try to repair that, and that causes other unexpected interactions. So it's a very difficult game. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm really interested to see where Fortran is going in this uh, regard. Yes, it's a good question. If, if there will be any fun fallout from all the things we've discussed during this course and all the other evolutions. Yeah, I think Fortran generics in its basic form will come as I presented it with some variation of the syntax. Uh, initialization of arrays in Fortran, I'm not an expert on that, so I can't tell you how that will happen. Yeah. And let's see, on my other points, I already covered number nine, and number 10 was pretty much repeating what uh, Jonas was saying at the same time. Yeah. yeah, do you have a next question? Uh, no, I think I'm fine. Okay, good. Thanks. Thanks, Lars. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay, then. I think we should.